I'm Christine Russo, and welcome to What Just Happened. Today, we welcome Brandon Singer, CEO and founder of Retail by Mona. Hi, Brandon. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Thank you for having me. I can't wait to really get into the real estate scene, particularly in New York City, as it relates to retail. So let's get into Retail by Mona. Sure. Very interesting that you it, it came to be in the middle of the pandemic. As you've noted, everyone was leaving the city, including your your peers in competition. Mm -hmm. So that gave you an, an opportunity to swoop in. There's been a lot said about that. I was here, as we said, I started the company in smack in the middle of 2020. When I would walk around during the pandemic, saw this image in a window and I was like, that's new. The posters in New York stores for leasing for commercial real estate, retail spaces, flagship turnovers, were there were the regular crew. And I remember seeing your poster and being like, oh, looks like something new is up afoot. <laughs> so exciting to hear about that. The foundation for your company, Making of a New Age, Mona, Retail by Mona, like the name a lot, Making of a New Age, and the Thank whole, you. and the retail renaissance, everybody's back now. And there's a lot of activity in commercial real estate for retail. What were you seeing? How are things now? We've seen New York really bounce back, which is super refreshing from the pandemic. We've seen the luxury players, the LVMHs, the Kerrings, the Richemonts of the world, and, and, and every other big company, every big designer, they've all been super active in New York with different strategies for flagships, for like new like new experiments in new markets like Williamsburg. As you've seen recently, there's been a lot of news in the press about some of these big companies buying their real estate now as opposed to leasing on Fifth Avenue. It's interesting because those luxury brand, those houses that purchase their real estate, I wanted to really understand if that's not a distress signal in the market because while they're, they both paid almost a billion dollars for them and that's a great payout for ownership why is this happening and it's very interesting this is next level so can we get into that a little bit sure i think look they're hedging they're hedging fifth avenue where they're all buying is obviously when times are back in 2016 2017 rents on fifth avenue. i think the bulgari deal at the crown building was done at over five thousand dollars a foot these big numbers at a billion dollars or 800 million or 900 you know, million, I think if you back into it, I would imagine, and I, I haven't seen the actual deal sheet, but I just read what's in the press. I would imagine that they're probably underwriting somewhere around 2000 bucks a foot on the ground floor and they own it. It's that simple. So they're basically hedging. If, any, if everything happens the way it's happened in the past, which it likely will, Fifth Avenue will get back up to that, I don't know, about 5,000 a foot, but will definitely be more expensive than 2,000 a foot. So because of that, I think they looked at it as a long-term real estate play to control the narrative. It's Fifth Avenue, Manhattan, as good of retail real estate that there is, arguably the most prominent corner and subsequent block to the south in the world. And because of that, I think they just wanted to control the narrative. They obviously have such a big presence there already. Kering has Gucci across the street at, at Trump Tower. So they just, they locked up the other corner. And Prada obviously had their store there. So they locked up the, their real estate also. There's a rumor now that LVMH is in the market and is negotiating on the Bergdorf men's building to buy. I don't know how true that is. It was in the press and we'll see if it actually happens. There was rumors in the past that they were looking to acquire the Barneys, the former Barneys building on Madison. Look, all these buildings are geographically adjacent to one another, with the uh, plus minus a block south, north, east, west. And like I said, it's the it's the 50 yard line of retail on a global scale. It doesn't really get any better. So if there's a place to hedge and, and secure the real estate, this is where it is. Why did ownership sell? I think at the end of the day, if you know, if you get an offer from somebody and they're your logical tenant and they're saying, we're not going to lease it, but we'll buy it from you have, you know, you have to listen to where the market's dictating. Now, the one thing that I, that I think is an interesting angle to look at and what I'm about to say, I hope I'm wrong. I just want to be clear is that I hope that given the, the big price tag that these companies are paying, it doesn't preclude them from making real estate decisions in other parts of the city because they say to themselves, all right, we don't need to go sign a lease 
you know, on Madison Avenue, or we don't need to go sign a new lease in Soho. We might as well just house all our brands in this mega department store that we have in one location. So I hope that's not the after effect of it. I don't think it will be. It could be, but we'll see. So, you know, the jury's out and it's going to take a couple of years to see how it all shakes out. Yeah, that's a good point. Do, do you think that the issues in CRE right now from the interest rate increases over the past 18 months contributed to ownership selling? Could have, but yeah, I don't know what his the debt situation is. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't want to misspeak. It likely did, yes, but who knows? We're in a time, and we've been here before, although we're not in a recession, it, it's similar. There's a similar situation occurring, which is if you have a lot of cash, it's a good time to <laughs> put out some offers. Totally. And see who bites. To your point, with interest rates so high, the cost of capital and CapEx is, is through the roof. So owners are saying, you know what, we'll build it for you. We'll give you a big TI allowance. So there's different metrics that they're offering to the restaurant occupiers to, to take space. There's And then there's different components of the deal that kind of come back to help the owner. Maybe it's a low base rent with a percentage rent over a break point. There's different ways that owners are participating in the deal, um, which has helped fuel a lot of the leasing momentum of the up and B players. You did a lot of work in meatpacking. Yep. I've done a lot of work in meatpacking. It's a f funky, funny little area for retail and has been for a while. What are your thoughts on where that stands since the Gucci store opened? That's a crazy story that deal, but for we'll be here for two hours if I told you how that all happened. That was a one that was an amazing process to be involved with. But meatpacking has been we just did a deal, another deal, a pretty significant new age retailer that's well capitalized. One of these direct to consumer brands just signed a big, a, a nice lease with us. But um, in addition to that, look, we did the Fisker deal there, which is the car, the automotive concept, like the, the electronic car company. You have Tesla there, you have Lucid, you have Fisker, you have Rivian, and you, the luxury players have been super active um, in meatpacking. And I think there's a, a number of reasons why, like you said, it's cool, it's funky, it's hip, it has that like New York City grunge that a lot of areas don't, but also is refined, right? It has a sort of an elevated type feeling when you walk down Gansevoort Row. You're hearing leases being signed at rec at numbers in the meatpacking district, in the interior meatpacking district that are frankly five plus years ago you would have told me i was crazy if i told you those numbers were going to get actually get achieved per square foot it's a place that people want to be so because of that i think you'll continue to see more growth in the district what, what is the story with foot traffic it's very it's like either very well what's the okay let's talk about the demographics of the area it's a lot of tourists yep which is great for retail and they drive i think the foot traffic and so it's really more of a weekend scene and the weekday scene is uh, locals and just well, you, have, you, like... have, you have google and 12 million square feet of office space right there now how many people are coming to work and how many days i don't a week i don't know but if things come back to normal or some semblance of normal that's a humongous driver of people that are for the most part pretty well compensated high income spenders that are looking to I don't know if you've been down to 15th Street recently on the south side of the Chelsea Market. Unreal. That street used to be no man's land. You wouldn't even think to walk there. And if you walk it now, the whole street is activated with F&B concepts trying to take advantage of that. So I think, yes, to your point, it's tourism. It's local New Yorkers that want a cool place to go and escape. But in addition to that, and the Whitney and the High Line and the nicer weather in Little Island, but in addition to that, Google is a pretty big component of, I think, the, the future growth of that neighborhood for obvious reasons. Very interesting. I Very interesting that that's a, a major factor that, let's say, you're presenting the area to a brand and they're like, where should we go in New York City? We would go here because of this and here because of that. And it sounds to me like Google office presence is a major selling point for that area. Mm -hmm. Let's do a little recapping. Return to office is a major um, elephant in the room for New York City real estate, period. Is that mm -hmm. a correct assumption? Yeah, for sure. No matter the neighborhood. 
no matter where yes obviously you need people there it's really that simple look there's people on the streets i don't know what they do all day or where they go but the streets are busy so i'm they're here doing something i don't know what it is but I, if they're not going up to their offices they're going somewhere okay very interesting because there's a lot of chatter about it about midtown and blah 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 and the little pita shop that's next door and how they can open and can't service and they're going out of business but I like one major takeaway out of this is that it's actually everywhere in New York City, including what was never an office area, meatpacking, and how that area has evolved the way it has in conjunction with the office growth there. Let's talk about your actual business. You are in a very competitive space. You're up against huge companies that have really, over the past 20 years, just eaten everyone's lunch and become some the the as industries do as they mature they become bigger and fewer players and then you come along and here you are you're ready to disrupt everything and you're ready to go for it and it was kind it was perfect timing you did it when no one was looking the occupier pool of tenants that are out there a lot of them are new age brands not in the sense that they tried to change the way that they they retail but there, a lot of them are digitally native, meaning they started on social media or they started on with customer acquisition on Google or other things, or you know, just different ways they started. And as they've grown, now they realize, whoa, we got to open stores, right? It was time to do things in a modern way. And one thing that set you apart is that you opened the dialogue on a sign to say, text us, which felt so small and simple, but certainly, resonated with leadership of digitally native brands, direct to consumer, Shopify plus type of companies that realize the importance of physical retail. What would be one other example of a refreshed approach? One other one that sticks out is our social media presence. It's at retail by Mona on Instagram. If you look at it, you know, we've started to really yield the results of a couple of years now building up our following and who we're targeting. But everyone's, you're addicted to Instagram. Every, I am, unfortunately, I've tried to work on that, but the whole world is sitting there liking and scrolling and looking at stories all day. We might as well put the, the real estate in front of these people targeted and have them look at, oh, wow, this is an interesting, this is an interesting piece. So we DM it, we canvas and we DM the properties to the brands. Now, chances are I'm hitting some marketing person that just graduated college sitting in an office somewhere but it's a it's an in to the brand. They then pass that on to the right person that sees it in a different angle. The other thing, which has nothing to do with a modern technology, is the way that our we're structured internally. This is probably the most important thing. The bigger firms are structured, as you probably know, and if not, I'll, I'll fill you in. It's teams, right? So there's the team leader, and then there's the people that work for that person. That team competes with the team sitting in the office next to them, even though they wear the same flag of the company they're at, they're competitors and they don't share info necessarily. Negotiations get tough. The way we're structured is it's one collaborative team. Everyone here is part of the team. Now, sure, different brokers are doing different deals with different clients and they're not partners on everything, but it's an open format. Uh, I wish I could show you, but it's an open, everyone sits out there in, in an open setting and collaborates and talks and meets and shares information. And it's a more, uh, it's a more open type of approach to a business that's been super siloed and super tight and, and competitive and argumentative and nasty for too long. That's the biggest thing, in my opinion. So those three examples are very innate to you. You you are the embodiment of that. That's how you live your life. And little did the industry know that's actually it seems so simple, but it's, it is a very refreshed way to go about doing business. First, means of communication, meet them where they are. They don't want to use the phone. Let's break through and have texts. Then meet them where they are. They're on social media. Even the owners of these of a lot of these D to C companies are they build their businesses on social media. They're on social media. If you pay for ads, you're going to get in their feed. So love that breakthrough and the last one is very interesting and here's my perspective of it uh, an industry and a company is only as good as its people mm -hmm. and if the old school industry is built on 
the way the the things that you said that's not how business is really done anymore and you're not going to funnel in new fresh talent so you've switched the narrative and you've made it more of a I, I dare i say safe space for people to grow their career and have a collaborative working environment that's what the worker wants right like overall it's a giant generalization but it is a known fact mm -hmm. that happiness at work and satisfaction at work is a major piece of the puzzle and it looks like you've really tapped into that so those three things while they sound fairly simple are quite innovative yeah thank you yeah i, I just totally agree with you it's fun I'm, thank you and i appreciate the the pat on the back it's it means a lot from a veteran like you but the other thing that you know ideas are great theories are great it's working, which is the point, which is the part of the thing that's actually the most interesting. It's actually working and we're seeing crazy success and results from a little tweak in the business, just refreshing it, so. I wanna thank you, Brandon. It, this was thank a you. great discussion. It yep. was really great to get to know you and what you've been up to at Retail by Mona. Thank you so much for the time and I hope to meet you in person one day.